Why don't you guys say hello to one another as you're seated? Two warm in here now? Okay. <laughs> Listen, we are in Luke chapter 6 this morning. We we'll need a Bible. Just slip up your hand. There will be an Operation Overwatch update immediately after the uh, message this morning, so if you want to stick around for that, we'll be talking about the beast and the variant, so you might not want to miss that one. Luke chapter 6, Lord willing, we'll finish out this chapter on the Sermon on the Plain today, and uh, so let's dig in. Verse 39. And he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So, Lord, we lift this message up to you today. Your word, we know, never returns void. So I pray that as it goes forth today, that it would do exactly as you will it to do in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives, Lord. I pray now for Phyllis as she's struggling with cancer. I pray that you just touch her and heal her now, Lord. We lift up our brother Matt to you as he's struggling in a, in a whole different way, Lord. But you know the situation there. We just pray for your hand upon him. Pray, Lord, that you get a hold of him and get a hold of his heart. Lord, we lift up our brother Keith to you. We pray, Lord, for this upcoming test that you would be in that. We pray for Joe as he's home, Lord, uh, struggling with um, well, the doctors don't know what's wrong, and we pray for wisdom there. We pray for wisdom for the doctors. We pray, Lord, that someone would get to the bottom of this and, and be able to give him an answer. So, Lord, we lay all these things at your feet, and we ask it in your name. Amen. So, in Matthew chapter 23, it's the woe chapter. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And in verses 16 and 24... Jesus calls the scribes and Pharisees blind guides. And he calls them that because they were supposed to be leading the people of God, leading them to love God with all their heart, to love their neighbor as themselves, both of which are found in the Torah. Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy 6.5, you'll love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. But instead of leading the people in the ways of God, they were leading them astray. Listen to this scathing indictment that Jesus has against the Pharisees. So, practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't preach what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and be called rabbi. Now, the scribes and Pharisees, as I said, were supposed to be helping people get to know God, get to know his love, but instead they made so many burdensome laws in addition to the 613 that it became impossible for people to follow. It was more than they could bear. And on top of all of that, they weren't even following God with a pure heart. Their hearts were full of pride. They said, look at me. Look at how spiritual I am as I follow every letter of the law. And Jesus calls them blind. Listen, they could see the law for itself. They could live out and expect others to follow the letter of the law, but they missed the heart and the spirit of the law. You know, if a blind person leads another blind person around, disaster is bound to happen, right? They're going to walk into traffic. They're going to fall in a ditch. It's not a good situation. The point is only someone who could see past themselves, only with someone with sight can lead others to the love of God. 
And this is what Jesus said about the Pharisees seeking disciples for themselves, seeking people that they could train and lead. What, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell as yourselves are. Now, Jesus used the word woe when he rebuked them, and that word means more than just warning. It means sorrow. Jesus had a sorrow in his heart, a sorrow that if they continued to do what they were doing, that they would not see the kingdom of God. Now, not all the scribes and Pharisees were blind. Some understood the importance of the love of God. The teacher of the religious law, a scribe, replied to Jesus. He said, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying there is only one God and no other. And I know it's important to love with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The scribe had asked Jesus a question. Remember what it was? What is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus told him to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and to love your neighbors. The second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus told this scribe that he understood that loving God and loving his neighbor was more important than following the letter of the law. And because of that, that he was close to the kingdom of God. I mean, that's what the blind guides of Jesus' day were missing. They were missing the heart and the spirit of the law. Paul, who was once a Pharisee himself, wrote, let, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others is, has fulfilled the law. Romans 13, 8. He wrote to the Galatians, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 14. So Paul's telling us that the entirety of the law can be summed up in one operative word, love, love. Believers, therefore, are following the commands of Jesus by loving God and loving others, which is what Jesus said when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The first, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The scribe that Jesus told was close to the kingdom of God understood that the very core of the law was love. Now, Paul understood that concept because he wrote, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is what Jesus told the scribe in Mark's gospel was the greatest commandment, to love God with, you all, with your all and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the law of Christ. James commands us to love our neighbor as ourself, and he tells us it's the royal law. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. You get the point here? It's about love. We are, we've been filled with the Holy Spirit to help us to do this because in our own, in our own flesh, we have a problem loving our neighbor as ourselves, don't we? And we especially, as we learned last week, have a problem loving our enemies as ourselves. But the Lord has filled us with his Holy Spirit to help us keep this most important commandment to love God and love our neighbor. Does that mean the law or the Torah has no meaning for us today? Absolutely not. It's still an important part of the life of a believer. Paul wrote, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So the Torah acted as a guide and still to this day acts as a guide to help us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to help us to love God. But it also showed us how impossible it was to try and keep those laws ourselves, try to work our way into heaven. The law is beneficial to us today as a guide, not as a rule book, but as a guide. The only rule of law that we are under is the rule to love one another and to love God. Now, the law of Moses was something that humans are incapable of keeping perfectly in our own strength. And James told us, if you break just one of these laws, 
You've broken what? All of them. Listen, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. We know that from Scripture. He came to fulfill it. And when we come to Jesus, he imparts his righteous fulfillment of the law to us. Amen? But the law is always, always pointed to Christ. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Romans 10.4 Now, when I think of the law, I think of legalism. And I think of the legalism that sprung up around the law. People who say, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that, and believe that they're more spiritually mature than someone who doesn't do what they do, or more importantly, does what they don't do. When I think of those who say that there's things that we must do, rules that we must follow, traditions we must keep in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, I think of the thief on the cross. He was crucified for his crimes next to Jesus, but he recognized Jesus as Messiah. And he asked Jesus that he would remember him when he entered into his kingdom. And Jesus responded by saying what? You will be with me in paradise. He promised them that. In other words, you will be saved. What did the thief, this thief do that was different than what the other thief did? He repented. He repented of his sin. One thief, while he was mocking Jesus, this thief was repenting of his sin. He said, do you not even fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Did you catch that? He called upon the Messiah, Jesus. He repented of his sin. He acknowledged his sin. That's the same way you and I are saved today, isn't it? But I want you to notice something else. He didn't keep Torah. If he did, he wouldn't be hanging on the cross. He didn't read the Bible. He, didn't, he wasn't baptized. He didn't speak in tongues that we know of. And I doubt he abstained from alcohol, from dancing, smoking, or any other vice you could think of. Yet he was saved. You see, it isn't about laws. It's not about rules. It's not about traditions. It's not about personal convictions that we have to adhere to. It's about love. It's about the love of God for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What the thief on the cross had was faith. And faith is the very core of, well, our faith. The thief had faith that Jesus was the Messiah. And we're saved by the same way, by faith. It is grace. We're saved by God's grace through our faith. Everything else we do in this life should revolve around living a life that leads others to that same saving faith that we have. Legalism. Tradition, rules, personal convictions will not lead someone to the saving faith that you have. In fact, in many cases, it drives them further away. It's the love of Christ that draws people in. It's the love that they see in us and experience through us. You know, I remember when I was first introduced to the Christian faith, I was invited to a small Bible study in a home right next door to where I lived. And I remember sitting at that kitchen table like it was yesterday. And I, and I couldn't tell you what the study was about. I couldn't even tell you everyone that was there that night. But I can tell you of the love that these people had for me and the love that I felt from them. They, present, they didn't present me with a list of laws and rules and personal convictions that I had to follow because had they done that, I doubt that I ever would have went back. What they did present me with was the love of Christ. And they invited me to follow him. That's the key. Follow Jesus. He's our teacher. Our desire should be to be more like him, to love like him, to be as accepting of others as he is. And you will be keeping the greatest commandment, the law of Christ, if you do. Listen, as humans, we're never going to agree on everything. You know, I always said you could put 10 rabbis and 10 commentators in a room and give them one verse and they'll fight to the death over that verse. We will never agree on everything. But let's at least agree on this one main thing, to be more like Jesus and to love God with all our heart, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Verses 41 through 42. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, 
Let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Listen, we're generally far more tolerant of our own sin than we are of sin in others, aren't we? You know, when the woman caught in adultery was brought before Jesus, he confronted this issue by telling the scribes and the Pharisees, who among you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone at her. Who among you that caught this woman in sin is without sin in your own lives? Well, as they pondered that question, those stones began to fall to the ground, didn't they? Those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. The older ones knew that they had far more sin in their lives. They realized they were being hypocritical. They realized that they were judging someone else for their sin when they were sinners also. Paul wrote to the Romans, You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You abhor idols. Do you rob temples? Do you make your boast in the law? Do you dishonor God through breaking the law? You see, when we judge others, we're also condemning ourselves as well. Did you ever hear that when we point the finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at us? Paul wrote, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are Whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. We must be willing to evaluate ourselves honestly and accurately before we start pointing the fingers at other people. Jesus said, don't judge, or you too will be judged. For the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. For in the way you judge, you shall be judged, and by standard of measure you use, it will be measured to you. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you, Luke 6.38. So does that mean we should never judge a brother or sister in sin or help them take the speck out of their eye? Paul wrote, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path, onto the right path, rather, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Listen, before we can help a brother or sister remove the speck from their eye, we must honestly deal with the sin in our own life first. You know, we need to adopt the attitude on a daily basis that I am a sinner, just like everyone else around me, maybe worse than everyone else around me. Paul called himself the chief of all sinners, right? He said, I, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. Any, anybody in here can relate to that? To judge someone else in sin, there's a difference between judging and being judgmental. When you judge someone else in sin, it's like you should be saying in your heart, man, I know what that person is going through. I know why they're acting the way they are acting because I am guilty of doing the same thing. And someone at some point in my life helped me to see the speck in my eye. Maybe I can help this person the same way I was helped. But to be judgmental is to look down on a person who is doing the exact same thing that you're guilty of doing and criticizing and judging them for it and saying, look at that sinner. I'm glad I'm not like him, just like the Pharisee and the tax collector. They were both praying in the temple. The Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Well, the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said it was the tax collector, not the Pharisee, that went away righteous. The Pharisee was being judgmental. He looked down upon the tax collector as a sinner when he was a sinner too. You know, when we deal with the sin in our own life, it's then that we can help someone else see the sin in their own life. Look at verse 43, 45. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. 
A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Listen, this illustration that Jesus gives us here doesn't need an interpretation. It's pretty much self-explanatory, isn't it? When a person has been changed by Jesus Christ, there's a change in their lives and in their hearts. A follower of Jesus Christ is to be known by our fruit. So a changed life brings forth good fruit, while an unchanged life continues to bring forth bad fruit. And the proof of a changed life can be determined by your speech, Jesus tells us. Because what's in our heart generally will come out of our mouths. You know, before I was saved, I used a certain four-letter word like an adjective. And after I was saved, that word repulsed me, and still does today. So did taking the Lord's name in vain, which I did frequently before I got saved. That absolutely makes me cringe today when I hear it. So there's definitely a change there. But Jesus is telling us that you can see from a person's heart, you can see a person's heart, rather, by what comes out of their mouth. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, it's not what enters the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds from the mouth that defiles the man. You know, when a person is constantly using foul, immoral, lewd, and hurtful words and are constantly exhibiting bad behaviors, that is indicative of a sinful heart. We are to be known by our fruit. And if our fruit is bad, what's on the inside will be bad as well because fruit rots generally from the inside out, doesn't it? However... It is possible to put up a front. We used to call this in biblical counseling stapling, stapling fruit. You know, if you staple the apple to an apple tree, eventually it's just going to rot off the tree, right? There's nothing providing any nutrients to it. Just like an avocado. How many times have I been tricked into thinking this avocado was good until I cut it open and it was just black inside, rotted? Listen, just know eventually whatever's on the inside is going to come out. So we're called to be fruit inspectors. We're called to observe, to recognize, and to respond accordingly to those who we see exhibiting bad fruit. But being a fruit inspector doesn't mean that we consider ourselves to be without sin. It just means that we're being realistic. It just means that we know that a believer is known by their fruit, and if we're seeing bad fruit or not any fruit at all, then maybe that person needs help. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, a Christian can generally be known by his very appearance. The man who really believes in the holiness of God and who knows his own sinfulness and blackness of his own heart, the man who believes in the judgment of God and the possibility of hell and torment, the man who really believes that he himself is so vile and helpless that nothing but the coming of the Son of God from heaven to earth and his going to the bitter shame and agony and cruelty of the cross could ever save him and reconcile him to God. This man is going to show all of that in his personality. So how do we approach somebody who's ex exhibiting bad fruit? Well, first, we must know that our own fruit would pass inspection, right? We must remove the plank from our own eye so that we can help them see the speck in their eye. And we must approach that person with the same attitude that we are a sinner just like they are. We're no different than them. We're no better than them. And we need to help them, as we need help, to be more like our sinless master. Amen? Amen? Verse 46, probably one of the most convicting verses in the entire Bible. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Hmm. Be enough just to let that float over the room, wouldn't it? Now, the word Jesus uses here for Lord in the Greek is kurios, which means... He to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power or deciding, master and lord. It also means the possessor and disposer of a thing, and the owner who is has control over a person because he is the master. So the Bible is very clear that we belong to Jesus. Knowing that you were redeemed with perishable, knowing that you were not redeemed rather with perishable things like silver and gold. From your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So we've been redeemed by the sinless, spotless lamb of God. We've been redeemed by his blood. And that word redeemed means to buy out. It's a term used specifically 
for reference to the person, to the purchase of a slave's freedom. So if we're redeemed, that means we were once slaves to sin, slaves to sin and Satan. And the good news is that Jesus purchased us with his blood. He gave us freedom. We're no longer in bondage to sin or to Satan. We belong to Jesus. He's our Lord, meaning that he has the right to tell us where to go, what to do, how to live. He has that right. We belong to him. And because he's Lord of our lives, he has authority over everything in our life. And we're to recognize and submit to that authority. Jesus told his disciples that we're to refer, in what we refer to, rather, as the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Do you know what the word commission means? It means to authority to act for or on the behalf of or in the place of another. We've all been given authority. All been given authority to teach the things that Jesus has commanded us to teach. And what are those commandments? They're found throughout the Gospels. They're found especially in the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. Love others. Love our enemies. Don't commit adultery. Don't pray repetitious prayers. We could go on and on and on but it's all right there for us. The point is, we should be doing as Jesus commands us if he is our Lord. Verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it. It was because it was founded on the rock. Listen, there are things that happen in this world, in our life, that will shake us to our very foundation. One such incident occurred in 1994. Pastor Scott Willis and his wife Janet had their foundation shaken to their very core with some, when something unimaginable happened to them on a family trip. They buckled their six youngest children out of nine into the family van on November 8, 1994, and started out from their home in Chicago to Wisconsin. And driving north on Interstate 94 in Milwaukee, the van ro ro drove over a large piece of metal in the road. And that metal bounced up and punctured the gas tank, exploding the gas tank. And after Pastor Willis brought the van to a stop, the entire back of that van where his children were was engulfed in flames. Five of their children died instantly in their sleep in the back. The sixth child died later in the hospital from his burns. As their mother screamed, no, 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 Scott touched her shoulder and said, Janet, this is what we've been prepared for. It was quick, and they are with the Lord. Listen, the wise man builds his house on the rock, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus isn't giving us construction advice here. He's giving us spiritual advice. The rock is Jesus, and we're considered wise when we come to him, when we hear his teachings, but more than that, when we put them into practice in our lives. And he says, you will be like a house built on the solid rock of a foundation. How did the Willises practice what Jesus taught after this unimaginable tragedy? This is what they said at a press conference. What gives us our firm foundation for our hope is the Bible. The truth of God's word assures that Ben, Joe, Sam, Hank, Elizabeth, and Peter are in heaven with Jesus Christ. We know based upon the word of God where they are. Our strength rests in the word of God. The Bible is sure and gives us confidence. Everything God promises is true. The storm came against the Willises. The rain of pain and suffering beat down upon them. A flood of grief came against them. But they, their house, their foundation, their spiritual foundation was built on the rock, Jesus Christ. And they withstood that storm. Now, I personally know what that storm looks like and feels like. I have cried on my knees, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shall we indeed accept good from the Lord and not accept adversity? And I can tell you firsthand that if your foundation is not solidly built on that rock, you will not weather a storm like that. 
And in, it's in his word, in his promises, that we find peace and comfort in the midst of any storm we're in. We know that he's there with us. We know because we can feel his presence. And isn't that what the word tells us? That he is with us always, even till the end of this age? He's with us in the storm. He's with us right now, all of us, in the storm that we're in. A storm that's raining down torrents of anxiety, causing raging floods of fear. Anxiety over what the future may bring, over, over a virus, a fear over government control, over fear of loss of a job. Listen, allow me. In fact, please turn to Matthew chapter 6. This is a little lengthy, but it's a needed reminder in this world that we live in today. Matthew 6, we're going to look at verses 25 through 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all this glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, all, knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The great thing about that passage of Scripture is that passage of Scripture needs no interpretation either. It is, again, self-explanatory. What needs to be done with that passage of Scripture is we need to put it into practice in our lives. Don't worry. Jesus has this. Don't put your hope and trust in the government, in science, in medicine, in education, or any other man-made institution. Put your hope and trust in Jesus, period. Look at verse 49. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on, on earth without the foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So if building our house on the rock, Christ Jesus, means that we don't worry, don't, we don't get anxious for anything. We pray about everything. We cast our worries and concerns upon him and trust in him for the outcome. Then building our house on the sand is to build our spiritual foundation on the worries and concerns of this world. These are the everyday distractions and fears that prevent us from trusting in our Savior as Lord. Listen, I know there's some scary things that happen in this life. And, and I know that even the bravest among us get scared at times. And we're not supposed to worry, are we? But sometimes that's easier said than done, right? But just remember, we might feel afraid, but we believe that God's with us. We may not be in control, but we know the one who is. We may not know the future, but we know that God holds our future. And we can remember and meditate on the words of Jesus because he gives us comfort in his word. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give to you. I do not give peace as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Mark 6.50. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Mark 5.36. And this is my favorite. Although not spoken by Jesus, it is about him. Flip over, if you would, to the Old Testament, which is to the left of where you just were. Or is it this way? Yeah, it's to the left. <laughs> Psalm 23. It is six short but very powerful reminders of who God is in the storms of our life. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me on paths of righteousness for his namesake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will feel no, fear no evil, for he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I have committed that psalm to memory, and I pray that when storms come at me, when I'm in the midst of a storm. And I love that psalm, but one of my favorite verses in that psalm is you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How comforting is it to know that in the midst of a raging battle, like the one you may be in right now, when it seems like you're surrounded by enemies, when, when there's nothing going right in your life, when it seems like there's those who wish to do you harm, when the storms of life are beating you down and the floods, floods of anxiety and fear and worry threaten to sweep you away, here's Jesus setting a table in the midst of all of that with the finest tableware, a fine, white, crisp linen tablecloth, and all of delicious foods that you love to eat. All your favorites are there. And Jesus is just holding out his hands, inviting you to sit down with him. Sit down and enjoy a meal. Sit down and relax in the midst of the chaos that's swarming around you. That's the picture that he's painted here for us. And in reality, it means for us that even in the midst of the most violent storms of life, there is nothing more comforting, supporting, or helping than Jesus Christ as he helps us get through those storms. But be assured, he is with us no matter what we face, the turmoil, the struggles, anything that comes against us, the, the anxiousness, the, the fear, the worries. He is there strengthening us, helping us, holding us up with his righteous right hand. And always remember, God is greater than any storm you may find yourself in. And he gives us the power to live courageously, boldly, fearlessly in this life. We are to live without fear, right? Even when everything surrounding us is a cause for fear. His word strengthens us right to our very core. And if you need that assurance today, if you need that peace, that comfort that comes from putting your trust in Jesus Christ, it's as simple as ABC. And I am blessed to be able to do this each and every Sunday as long as the Lord allows us to, as long as the Lord has breath in my lungs. I'll keep telling people about him and about his gift to salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner, that you've fallen short of the glory of God. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, for we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. How many sinners in the room this morning? I'm glad some of you are perfect. Thank you. There's hope for the rest of us. Paul wrote, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, turning to Jesus, asking to be forgiven, set free from our sin, is the only way that we're made perfect in the eyes of God. The next step is B, believe with your heart. Believe with all your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died for your sins, that he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Romans 10, 10 through 11 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So once you admit you're a sinner, and you believe Jesus died for those sins, we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And that brings us to see. Call upon his name. Submit to him. Submit your will to him. Surrender your life to him. And Ask him to be your Lord and Savior, meaning that you need to die to self and let Jesus be Lord of your life. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen, it's as simple as that. Call upon the name of the Lord, just like the thief on the cross. Acknowledge your sin. Call upon his name. And you will be saved. And if that's you this morning. If you don't know the Lord as your Lord and Savior, if you want to have that peace and comfort, then I'm going to ask you just to slip up your hand. Just slip up your hand this morning. And if you're listening online, if you don't know the Lord, it's as simple as calling on his name, asking him to be your Lord and Savior, submitting to him. Amen? So we're going to stop now. We keep facing.